Hello and welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite book. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today I'm joined by Katie Leap Ardetti. Katie is a consumer of all things thriller and fantasy, a business owner, a massage therapist, and one of my favorite book club friends. Katie selected a book so totally out of my wheelhouse that I actually contemplated not reading it. You know, I figured, who would know? I could just ask her to describe the plot, and that alone would take up the entire episode, because this book is gigantic. But I am so glad I resisted that temptation, because the book we talked about turned out to be easily one of my favorite reads of 2022. It was a delightful talk about the importance of smart heroines, rollicking adventures through foggy London, and handling tremendous personal grief. Even if, like me, you think historical fantasy is not your thing, you can trust Katie when she says that Ordinary Monsters is the best book ever. Hi, Katie. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi, it's so good to be here. (laughs) I want to start with something that you wrote in your bio. You said in talking about your book life that, and I'm quoting you here, Mm -hmm. hearing people's issues all day really makes me reach for a good book. Will you share what that's all about? Yeah. So I am a massage therapist and I've been one for 18 years. So it's interesting in being a massage therapist, you actually have a really personal touch and personal relationship with your clients after you've been seeing them for a long period. And after some time, they start really sharing and like opening up with you. They can really share some very personal, intimate things going on in their life. That's causing their stress that I'm going to try to help with. And so they're, they'll talk about death of parents, siblings, friends. They'll talk about illnesses, sicknesses. So many of my clients are caregivers of family members. Um, you know, they're basically coming to me because they want to de-stress from their lives. So I am taking all of that in and hearing it. It's interesting. I do have people who come in every week to see me. And you really get to know their life story. And I do preface every person that comes through my door, new patient. If you want to talk, let's, you can talk. Um, But when you're done talking, I won't start talking. So if you want a quiet massage, a talkative massage, it's up to you. Every time can be different. So, you know, yeah, I, I am, when I get massages, I like it silent. I don't Mm -hmm. like to talk. I (laughs) have left therapists because they talk too much. I mean, it can really get heavy after, you know, six hours a day of hearing people's life stories. It just gets to be a lot. So reading books takes like me out of that, takes me away from that. When you get home, does your reading change based on the kind of day you've had, the genres that you choose? I am a mood reader. I'm a season one reader and I'm a mood reader. So if I'm just really like uh, like this time of year fall, I reach for dark academia. I am very much into the seasonal read. I actually, my Mm -hmm. sister-in-law, she asks me for book recommendations sometimes. And I said, Oh, I have the perfect book for you. And I said, "Mm, wait, no, that's a summer book. Okay. (laughs) I need you to read rock, paper, scissor. Cause that's a winter book. (laughs) What makes it winter? Because it's, um, it's snowing. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's, you know, it's all, I think they're in a second of snowstorm. So it's very dark wintry, cold. Yeah. I would not want to read that if it was in the summer. Were you always a reader when you were a kid? Yeah, I was. I did um, read quite a bit. And, you know, as a child, my favorite book was the Oz series, which was like the magic of Oz, mm-hmm. which was kind of, I mean, looking back at that kind of book, I'm like, oh, that was pretty heavy. I didn't pick up on that kind of thing when I was younger. Some of those heavier tones and messages, but I, for sure, as an adult, looking back at that book, like, oh, there's some heavy meaning in that. Tell me how you found Ordinary Monsters. Okay. So, um, again, another Instagram group. So I joined a group, um, through a friend, um, DJ he's in San Diego and he invited me to this reading group where a bunch of um, women came together and started reading a lot of, um, 
I think there was a lot of fantasy books and I wasn't in any group like that. My normal book clubs I'm in is OC books and brunch, which is, um, more, they do romance autobiography or nonfiction, fiction, literary, like contemporary literature, um, thriller. And then I'm in a thriller book club. We only read thrillers, but none of those book clubs do any sort of fantasy which is fine. I don't even mind, but thankfully there's the Instagram group I came to and they were reading empire of a vampire. I think that's Mm. what it's called. And, um, they are so fun and they're so funny. I just love (laughs) their reactions to things being in an Instagram group. I, I encourage a lot of people to just go out and seek these things out. If you like a book, just look up the hashtag And find some people who like it and start a group to talk about your favorite books because it's hysterical when you're reading a book along with other people and they are getting it the same way you are, or they are reading things in a different context as you. So we read Empire of the Vampire. It was great. It was super fun. Had a great time. So then the next book that we, that they wanted to pick was Ordinary Monsters. And I already had it on my shelf because, um, I might be a cover snob. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay. <laughs> it has a very cool cover. Okay. <laughs> it really um, does. Yeah. It does. It's a beautiful, stunning cover. Um, but I was actually at uh, Barnes and Noble and I made friends with a girl at the store and she always recommends me books to read. I was eyeing that one and she said, you better take that one home. You are going mm. to love it. And I go, okay. So sit, sit on my shelf for a while. It's a big book. It's pretty thick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it is a big fat book. It's a big fat book. And I, again, kudos to you reading this one because (laughs) I seriously was, you know, I was very, very, I was just contemplating giving this one to you because yes, it's my favorite, but I felt so bad. It was so long. You're such a trooper. Um, But man, I mean, when you start reading it, it's, you do, it it goes by quickly, but it also, it's so easy and fun to read. So um yeah, I I found this through many people forcing or not forcing me, encouraging me to read mm. the book, and I ended up falling in love with it. Okay, um, at this point, I always ask my guests if they could give a brief summary of the book to our listeners, and I'm just gonna apologize to you in advance because because uh, Godspeed, <laughs> but can you? <laughs> thanks. Yeah, because thanks. this book is something like thirty thousand pages long. So can you, you know? Somewhere around there, so give or take, give or take. Yeah. So can you give our listeners a, a summary of, of what Ordinary Monsters is about? Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Um, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you literally have to square your shoulders there. <laughs> totally centering myself right now. Um, this book is kind of broken up into parts. So it's based in our world in 1882, and that's the time frame. And you get a gist that there are people, or really children in this world that this book is about, that have special talents or powers. In the book, they refer to them as talents. Mm -hmm. Think of these guys like um, X-Men, like young X-Men. They have just very unique powers, very different. So in the book, there are people two people in particular that you're following, trying to find these children to bring them to an institute in Edinburgh to help them, one, protect them. Uh, A lot of these kids are outcasts and sadly discarded. And if anything, you know, abused really. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of these, this institute is trying to collect these children to bring them back to um, Edinburgh. The, so the beginning of the book is kind of the adventure of trying to find these two children and the lives of these two children in the beginning. And then the middle of the book is a little bit, they have the children they're bringing back to the Institute. It also involves the Institute itself. So <laughs> we're trying to, you know, uh, get the kids there. There's a lot of paralleling adventures and scary things very scary things that Mm -hmm. kind of keep you on the edge of your seat. Interesting things, sad things that come along the way to get to the Institute. And then you're at the Institute. You learn all about the history and we start really learning the histories of other children there and the history of the Institute itself, what it's doing, what it's protecting. And Mm -hmm. there is a villain in the story that's throughout. It's a former um, person from the Institute and a mystical being from the other side that has pretty much just possessed or, oh, 
well, what would you call it? Um, oh, it's kind of taken over this person's life and that's Jacob Marber, Mm -hmm. but it's, he's taken over his life and now is making him do things he, to get him to get these kids to this villain. The villain is taking these children's powers and using them to become even more powerful. And then at the end, kind of the compilation of all these things that, you know, have been happening through the book to, it's like a big Oh, action sequence ending. It's a great I, description. Thank you. <laughs> golf clap, golf clap. <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah. It's, it's, you can't get too wrapped up in the details because it's really going to be hard to explain, but it's, it's a beautifully done story. Mm-hmm. It's extremely well-written and I feel like it's past the, oh, what is that? Where they, the women talk about things that don't include men. I always forget the name of that. Oh yeah. The Bechdel test. I think it passes the Bechdel test. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's a big one for me. That's a big one for me. So smart women, emotional men, caring men, uh, people don't make dumb decisions. I mean, it checks all the right boxes for me with this one. Um, Listeners, if you haven't heard of it, I will link this in the show notes, but the Bechdel test, it, Katie, do you remember the details of it? It's it's more than two named women who talk mm-hmm. to each other about something besides a man. Is that yes. right? Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, that kind of thing. It's just this book to me, it, it made the difference because I do read, you know, a lot. Oh, gosh, I read so many books, <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, in the genre of fantasy, you know, there are some strong women characters. And I think that's why I like that genre so much. I've become to really like it because, you know, I will have to say if as a former thriller junkie, I mean, and a lot of people are like, into thrillers. This is like the genre now. I'd say, you know, 2020 was the year of the thriller and it's been going on. You know, now more and more thrillers I read, these women that they're writing as main characters are just like, oh, it's so frustrating. They're making Mm -hmm. bad decisions. They're not reliable. It's unreliable narrators. They're alcoholics. They're this, they're that. I mean, it's gotten really frustrating to the point where I just get mad at the characters now. I don't, I don't relate. I get mad at them. I can't, it's just, it's very frustrating. So I started kind of going more in the genre of fantasy or even it's light fantasy. Magical realism is another, if you aren't into fantasy, you think it's all fairies and, you know, werewolves (laughs) try magical realism where it's our world and it just has a hint of it. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting these women that are just so smart and make right decisions or make educated decisions. They're guided by emotions in the sense of they are, um, emotional, but they are so rational. And that is important to me. Like, yes, we can have emotions and still make proper decisions. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah. And I I think I know exactly what you're saying because it, I, I, I always trace everything back to Gone Girl in terms of sort of this new renaissance of thrillers. My favorite thriller in the world. Yes. Yes, I know. We've had this conversation because you you missed that opportunity. I know. And, <laughs> and you know, the person who did that podcast, kudos to them. They did a great job. <laughs> yeah, she did. But I think the thing is that sort of opened the floodgates for flawed female characters. And, but the thing is, flawed doesn't always have to mean stupid. Exactly. Yes. And and the main character in Gone Girl, Amy, was not stupid. She was kind of the opposite. She was flawed as hell. Yeah. But I I know exactly what you're saying. In the romance world, we call it TSTL, Too Stupid to Live. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) And I know exactly what you mean. Like, I want her flawed. I don't like perfect characters. They're boring and unrelatable and all that kind of stuff. But also, I want them to, you know have some sense about them. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, yeah. the main character is Alice Quick. She uh-huh. is um, getting the children from, you know, different parts of the country or the world and getting them to Margaret to get them to the Institute. So she's super strong, caring, emotional. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's physically strong. She mm-hmm. is actively strong. Um, she's protective of him. And um, she takes on that role. And Alice, and we're just like going back to what we we're talking about. So Alice and all these women are just very smart and make rational decisions. And, you know, Alice, she's um, a de- like a detective. She's smart. She's in- independent, but she's caring and fierce at the same time. And she has a wall up a lot of the time in the book, but there are times when the wall breaks down and you just see that other 
softer side of her. And it's like, it's there, you know, it's still, she's still caring. She still cares about these children so much, you know, and it's like, it's important to her to make sure that they're being cared for. Even after she gets them to the Institute, she's very like concerned about their well being and wants to make sure they stay. Okay. Cause the thing, the villain, the villains that are after these children are deadly. They are deadly, like zombie, crazy, creepy, scary (sighs) monsters that are after people. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's so funny as you're describing it, it's reminding me of what a massive cast of characters this book has. And as you said earlier about it being well-written, I mean, that is the key, right? Is that Mm -hmm. in the hands of a lesser writer, this book would have been a disaster because there is so much happening and both internal and external struggles and sort of magical struggles and also non-magic struggles, plus so many characters. And you never, I never felt bogged down by it at all. I was able to keep up with it. And I usually find gigantic casts very overwhelming. And this one, I always felt, I always knew exactly where we were. Yeah. And that's, that is the brilliance of it. I never felt confused about the timeline. I understood who each character was. There was never a moment where I was like, wait, who is that again? Never. And that happens to me in books quite a bit. And especially for this book being so long, Yeah, you know, you do really, you're like, I didn't ever feel like I didn't know who was who and what was going on or where we were in the space of the timeline. Now you told me before we started that you had a bunch of notes in front of you. So Mm. tell me, um, tell me some of the things you wrote down. Tell me what stands out to you, what parts you loved, what parts you most want to talk about with this book. Well, um, I, this book, covers so many. Now we've been kind of talking about, you know, yes, it's this, these kids and it's a story of adventure and getting to school. There are some very deep, interesting, important issues that are talked about in this book. Mm. So one of the characters, Charlie, again, one of my favorite kids in the book, we haven't Mm. even talked about him yet. And he's (laughs) one of my favorite characters. Again, lots of people. Um, He, in the beginning of the book, I mean, you hear about his backstory, Mm. Were you just dying? I mean, oh, I yeah. just couldn't get over it. 1882 in the South in America. Mm-hmm. Um, it was not kind to him. He was basically, uh, his, his father had left him. You kind of learn more about his father and why later, but his father kind of abandoned him. He was raised by his mother and they were slaves in, on a cotton field. And then from what I understand, Um, After his mother passed away, he was trying to, I think he was on a mission to find his father, ended up in an area that was actively very racist. Um, In in an act of trying to protect himself in a situation, he ended up killing the person, partly due to just him being able to be very resilient because his power is the ability not to sustain any injuries. So Mm -hmm. if he gets cut, it heals immediately. If they break his neck, it heals immediately. You can't kill him. You can't hurt him. Um, so he was, it's just, oh man, it's, it's hard. It's, Mm -hmm. it's hard, but important Mm -hmm. those types of books to me. And again, it's in magical realism. Like that's the crazy part that's they they're talking about all these really important things in a way that you're just are like, oh my gosh, this is so, even if with a kid who has magical powers, it's still so hard to hear. I mean, he's taken in by the police. He's basically held in a in a cottage in a shack that's just pitch dark all the time. He's abused and beaten every day because they think it's interesting. He can't die. And um, they keep trying to kill him for his, um, you know, his, uh, the murder, but you know, the self-defense murder mm-hmm. he did <laughs> and they can't, and they just don't know what to do with them. So they, the people from the Institute, thankfully get him out of there and they break him out. But you know, he feels all the pain just because he doesn't die and doesn't get hurt. He feels every cut, every hit, every kick. And that is the hardest part. I mean, I think I was on the verge of tears at one point, and this is like near the beginning. Again, it doesn't, didn't make me stop wanting to read it. It didn't make me, you know, it wasn't too much. It was just on that edge of, wow, this, and this happened and people didn't survive. And that's, is just, 
hearing about those things, it just, you know, reminds you of what the, what history that really happened is, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up because I thought that was one of the cleverest metaphors of Mm. how we treat people that we call, and I'm doing air quotes here that we call strong. Mm. And we assume that strong or resilient means they did not feel it. And it is really clearly addressed in this, which I thought was, I, 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 I cried on that part too when he talked about what it actually felt like and Mm. basically said, just because I healed doesn't mean it didn't hurt. Yeah, And it was one of those moments where I sat back and went, oh my God, that's it, right? Like we, this is one of those moments where a fictional fantasy story tells us more about real life than what we see in real life sometimes, because it is so easy to think, ah, she's strong. She can take it. Or she's uh, she's yes. going to bounce back. She's going to be fine. Yeah. She's going to bounce back. Doesn't mean it didn't hurt. Exactly. Doesn't mean she's not reeling mm-hmm. from it. And God, I thought it was well done that part yeah. of it. Yeah. Such a big takeaway. And there's so many takeaways from this. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the other, there's an, other storylines where they talk a lot about grief and death. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Gosh, I mean, <laughs> again, I mean, it's like the two of the characters lose siblings mm-hmm. that they are the caregivers for. Again, these kids are abandoned. All, all of them. None of them have parents. None of them have been are taken care of. They're outcasts because of their power or again strength. They're literally just given up. And these two characters, then the guy who turns into a villain later in life based on his um, grief and one of the other younger female characters who's from Tokyo, she, um, they both lose their younger siblings Mm -hmm. and it's about not being able to let them go. Right. I mean, (laughs) I like getting chills talking about it because it's just like, you know, I lost my dad and it's just so interesting because it is that whole what would you do to bring them back? And right. then, but really how would, like, how are you hanging on to that person when it's hurting you? You know, that memory of that person is, should be, you know, strengthening you and encouraging you and move, you know, the good memories, but man, these characters, it's like they are hurting themselves and the memory of that person, because they're holding on to the grief in such a, mm, uh, negative, I want to say way, you know, it, it's not helping anyone and especially it's not helping themselves. Yeah. I, and I really thought e- even aside from the, the, those two stories, which were, oh God, so, so compelling of losing the siblings, but the entire book really is a meditation on grief because every mm-hmm. single character has lost someone very, very important and is either trying to protect others from loss or is turning their grief into anger and rage and revenge. Yeah. And in a way, I I thought about grief a lot as I was reading this because in a way, a lot of this book is about, well, how are magic people going to act when they are when they have lost what they love and are not given, you know, to use therapist speak, they're not given mm. the tools to cope with their grief the way they deserve. And God, it's a, it's a sneakily. Deep- <laughs> it it's, is. It's very sneaky <sighs> in how emotionally complex it is. I mean, you know, if anyone's, um, dealt with grief or has lost someone recently, I wouldn't say to stay away from this because, you know, I, I, like I said, I'd lost my dad and yes, it's in there, but it's a relatable book. It's not like, uh, oh, it's yes, it's, it's tragedy for them, but it's relatable. Like they, you, you're going through it with them. I don't know. It's a lot of these people are learning from it and you see people who've already lost people from their past and they're, again, they're on the other side of it and they're stronger and they kind of talk about the lessons they've learned from it. I don't know. I mean, it didn't bother me to read this. I, there are books I cannot read yeah. because, and I won't because the, there's too much of the, there the misery of losing someone, but this one, 
this ordinary monsters is different. It's like the, you're moving again towards healing or, or you see how people don't move towards healing and how it affects them so gravely. Hmm. How it's spoken about in this book is just, um, it's really just moving and uh, it, it did not leave me feeling depressed or sad about grief in any sense. So, you know, I wouldn't let that stray you away from reading this book because it does actually, it's, it's just really beautifully written mm-hmm. and it, it gave me a little bit of a piece of like, yeah, what you know, when somebody moves on what what we do with our lives, I guess. And who would have seen that coming in this? I one? know. I know. And we're talking about children with X-Men powers. I mean, right. how, how did we get there? <laughs> right. Now, one thing that I found so interesting when you first told me that this is the book we were going to talk about, um, I went into it expecting a sort of a, a Harry Potter knockoff, mm-hmm. right? It's yeah. children at a magic school, essentially, Same. which that's not what it is. But I mean, that's sort of it, it, when you read the cover, that's what you think you're getting into. Yes. And, uh, you know, I listen, I love children's books. I love YA books. I, I love children against the world. I mm-hmm. get the reason we have those. And those are necessary and important things for kids to read. Um, and, and that's what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was fascinating about this was I couldn't decide if it was YA or adult the whole time I was reading it in some ways, it is a book about kids kind of saving the world, but the, the adults aren't necessarily a hindrance in this. Which is so cool because it it's like it walks the lines where the kids are really grappling with the absence of adults. Mm-hmm. But yes. the adults, you know, the the guardians and the detectives and the teachers, they're really fully formed and very complex in their own rights. They're not sort of buffoons who are getting in the kids' way. You know, they 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 have their they have very good reasons. And yes. And I can't remember a book where 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 both generations are so fully formed and um, everyone's heroic and everyone screws up. And, and I just found that so compelling because a lot of times when I'm reading, you know, when my kids were little and I was reading Harry Potter to them, Mm -hmm. they love the adventure, but I frequently would close the book and go, now, at which point would you have called an adult? <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> right? Like that's that's always the main flaw is, you know, you need to get adults involved in these situations. And right, in, this, yes. in this book, you you get this. I mean, of course, the kids do stupid things that they're we're, oh, we're, yeah. to, we're told not to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but For sure. You, you never felt like the adults were buffoons getting in their way. No, no, never. It, it, not at all. I mean, it was, that was the really interesting part. And I was actually afraid when we got to the Institute part, when we yes, got to the school, me too. I was like, oh crap. Okay. Right. It's coming because yeah, when you pick up the book, you do think it's Harry Potter-esque and it's totally different. They do have a good head on their shoulders, but as well as they know when, you know, to call it in and, you know, get the help they need if they need to. I mean, when they reach out to Alex, Alice quick, they, you know, go, they reach out to her and, you know, ring her and they know she's a safe, good adult who can help them. Right. Now, um, I use the word atmospheric a lot and I think Mm -hmm. I don't even entirely know what I mean when I say that. (laughs) (laughs) I can feel what you're saying. (laughs) You know, right? Like, yeah, totally. The most atmospheric book. And I don't know how to describe it, except that I could just, I could feel the fog of London on my Oh my gosh. Yes. How does he do that? I don't know. And it's probably one of the best atmospheric atmospheric books I've ever read. I mean, yeah, like you said, when he's talking about, oh my gosh, when he's talking about the streets of London, Mm -hmm. it's like, he talks about the, the moss growing on the side of the door and the, the smell of the, um, the puddles, the mud, how it's caking on, you know, their shoes and their, you know, skirts. But at the same time, it's not Stephen King where it's like, okay, I get it. I don't need every single sensory, you know, thing being 
read to me. I, I just need the keystrokes here. Right. Right. Um, right. It is so well done. It's not overdone, but yet you still, if you feel it, like I just, I literally reading this book is it's one of those. And I say this with certain books, it's like you're, as you're reading, you're watching the movie of it. Yes. You know? So it's like, you can really see it. You can, he develops it to where you can see what's going on, you know? And that was fascinating where, um, they get to a point in the book where it's a little bit more of an otherworldly area and, mm. oh my gosh, the <laughs> fog, the mist, the, the grayness of it. I, you could just see it, smell it, feel it. It was fascinating. I, this needs to be a movie. I mean, I, oh my I, gosh. I, this needs to be in movie development. Seriously. <laughs> this is, would be beautiful to watch. How did you read this? Did you read the book or did you do audio? Okay. Let me tell you. So okay. I did, I did both. Cause I was really worried. I wasn't going to get through it before we talked. Um, and so I, I got the hardcover from my library and I also got the audio okay. and let me tell you the audio. <sighs> I, I looked up the narrator. Yeah. Uh, ben, he's a British actor. His name's Ben <sighs> on I hope I said that right. Ooh. Ben, I know you're listening. Um, big fan of the show. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> let me tell you, he is brilliant. Like, oh, now you're a Southern California girl, so I know you're going to yes. get this reference. He sounds like the ghost host at the Haunted Mansion um, <gasps> at Disneyland. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, wow. He is wow. so Good. Like he's got this deep, a teensy bit gravelly voice. Ooh, stunning. And, oh my gosh. It was like, it was exactly the right voice for this, you know, using this word again for this atmospheric book. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, it was, it was perfect. I am so into that. Like I was hoping you were going to say audiobook. I was hoping because I read the whole book, but I am. So like, I just assumed this audiobook would be uh, hopefully amazing. And I wasn't sure. I just didn't know if I should download it, but hearing that, yeah. I think I'm going to do this book again on audio 110%. Okay. I, you, and I have talked books a lot in the last several months and I am sure you already know this about me, but, um, <laughs> I cannot tell you how hard I would not have picked up this book in the bookstore. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I did. I know. And that's, I literally, oh, I went back and forth on telling you this book. I only gave her, I only gave Julie one book to read. I literally was like, I didn't give her options. I was like, (laughs) ordinary monsters. And then I was like, if it's too much, just let me know. I didn't give her a list. No, 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 no. No, you Um, were very nice about it. But what I can tell you is, and, and, and this was part of the whole reason of starting this podcast was I, I would have, I would have ignored this book so hard. And I cannot tell you how much I loved it and have already purchased my own copy of it. And oh, yay. It is yeah. just such a delicious book. And boy, talk about yeah. seasonal reading. This is so a perfect good. time to read it right now. Fall, winter, get on it. Seriously. Yes. I am so happy to hear that. It puts a huge <laughs> smile on my face because I, you know, again, it's a, <clears throat> recommending books like this to people. It's, it can be iffy, but. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you loved it. And now that you have your own copy, yay. And I have my own copy and I'm going to, I can't wait for the sequel. I, and I agree yeah. it's going to make a fantastic movie someday or hopefully yeah. actually mini series because there's oh, so much. Yeah. To it. That makes it, more sense. Yeah. I want a lot of episodes so I can see everything. Cause if it were, if it were a two or two and a half hour movie, they'd have to cut out a lot of so much of it. Yeah. This yeah. is for sure the gateway book into. <laughs> Other than other genres. <laughs> oh God, I'm a fantasy junkie now. Is that what's I happening? Know. Oh, what? God. Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> yeah, I would say if you like thrillers, try this one because there are books. I mean, seriously, there are some scenes when like uh, Charlie's being chased. If you know mm. what I mean, I was seriously scared. It yeah. was it was scary. It was scarier or like, you know, thrilling, thrilling, scary. But I'm like, yeah. that does not happen to me in thrillers anymore. Thrillers just don't do it for me anymore. And sometimes horror now it's become so indie that it's like grotesque. Uh, mm. What do they call it? Gore porn. It's too much. It's like, it has to be super weird, like overly weird to be creepy now. Mm. I don't need that in my life. So Katie, tell me what you're reading right now. Okay. 
I will have to tell you, I do not like romance. So I just finished a book called Small Town Big Magic. Okay. And it's such a cute little book about a little, you know, tiny town and a girl uh, lives in it owning a bookstore. She comes to find out that the the, the town is actually full of witches mm. and she herself may have some powers and then bad things are coming the, to the town and she and her friends have to come together to save the town and the world. I um, have a few on deck. One's called Ring Shout by um, P. DeJelly Clark. And that is, it's about um, a guy trying to fight the Ku Klux Klan because the Ku Klux Klan was actually um, possessed by demons. So yes. that's why they are in that. I, that's what I believe. I haven't even... But it sounds fascinating to me because how else would a human believe in anything the KKK would be, yeah. uh, you know, would fight for unless they were t- possessed by a demon, you crazy yeah. psychos. It makes so, sense now. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so he's, you know, trying to uh, get get them unpossessed, I believe. So that actually did start um, late last evening. And, you know, I'm interested to get into that one, too. Both of those sound great to me, actually. <laughs> yeah, very, very good. I know, right? I think you'd like Small Town Big Magic. I mean, since you already have your toe dipped in the uh, fantasy little pool, that well, would be yeah. a good one to watch. And she's yeah. not too dumb for life. Oh, my gosh. Talk about woman warrior, <laughs> feminist to the max. She is like, I will not be held down by the male patriarchy. I mean, that is a line in the book. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm all in. Listen, I'm already a romance junkie. So there you go. Yeah. I, this, this sounds right in my wheelhouse. So I'd recommend that one big time. Well, so, yeah. why don't we tell our listeners where they can find you? All right. So I am on Instagram. I do have a book reviewing one. I'm not super active, but I'd love to see you there. It is rebel dot reads. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I just have some fun. I, I mainly post a lot about my book club fun times and you'll probably see some photos even of our lovely host here. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes we do bump into each other at yeah. uh, book club events and things like that. And yeah, it is very fun. Yes. Well, Gosh. I want to thank you for joining me today. It is, this has been such a great talk and phenomenal book. And um, I just look forward to anything you want to tell me about because I clearly love your taste in books. So <laughs> well, thank come you, back thank you. anytime. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. So, so much for having me. It was so fun talking to you about this book. And not many people like I know in my bubble have read it. So it's so fun to kind of really, um, you know, suss out the whole, yeah. all the deep and nitty gritty of it. So that was really, really fun to do with you. So yeah, I'm excited and I will keep you on the pulse of magical fantasy realism, <laughs> realness. Bookworms, I am so eager to hear if you've read this book and what you thought of it. Let me know over on Instagram at Best Book Ever Podcast. Links to everything Katie and I discussed are available on the show notes or at my website, bestbookeverpodcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen. Thank you for joining me today. And as always, I will see you at the library.